glorious undergraduates. This is the second lecture for week five of EDC 312. Today we're going to be talking about cognitive development. There's a lot going on in this chapter, so this may be a longish video. We're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so today we're going to talk about some key theories and theorists. Some of these guys might be someone you want to pick and talk about for your digital theorist posters. All right, uh, you'll get into more detail than I will um, if you choose one of these people to talk about. But these are the ones we're going to look at today. We got Piaget, Chomsky, who is also a linguist. Um, so interesting theories there. We'll talk about Gardner. Vygotsky, Flavel, Bronfenbrenner, Freud, and Erickson, who all of you psych majors have probably heard of, and then Kohlberg and his theory of morality and moral learning. So let's go. Let's do it. All right. Things you need to know about development, human development and learning development in general, right? So usually the sequence of development is somewhat predictable. You know, the stages that you go through in developing and learning as a human being are fairly predictable. We sort of know what order those things are going to come in. But keep in mind that children develop at different rates. Just because one kid is sort of trying to walk at six months, I don't know. I don't know when babies walk. Just go with it. Um, if one kid is trying to walk at six months, but another one is still crawling, that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong. Right? Um, at a certain point, we look at developmental delays and think, oh, th there might be a problem here. But there is some difference in the development of children and when they start learning to do things. So some of that is normal. Um, you know, development can be marked by what we call spurts and plateaus. A kid can develop super, super fast. And then all of a sudden, no more for a long time. Right? Uh, they might stay in one place of development for a long time. Uh, they may do it really slowly and then all of a sudden just seem to start developing and learning really fast for no reason. Spurts and plateaus, right? It involves quantitative and qualitative changes. We'll get into what that means a little bit later. Um, you know, there will be a lot of changes, quantitative, and qualitative, a lot of thinking about how the changes happened, why the changes happened, we'll come to it. Okay, so also heredity and environment affect development. Um, you know, if your mom was that kid who started walking very early, then you may be too. That's heredity. If you are in a physical environment that doesn't allow for that, uh, let's say, you know, you, you live in some very small space and you as a baby are confined to like your little pack and play and you don't have a lot of space to roam around. Well, yeah, maybe you don't feel the need to start learning to walk as early. Um, so it might come a bit later, right? Also, uh, children's own behaviors can influence their development. Like, if a kid is really curious and really interested in learning a lot of things, then they're going to seek out experiences that help them learn and develop a little bit faster, right? Okay, let's go over a few of the theories of cogn cognitive development. We're going to start with Piaget. Piaget thought that cognitive development came in four stages. The sensory motor stage, which is baby time, right? Birth to age two. The pre-operational stage, which is toddler to young childhood, ages two to seven, roughly. The concrete operational stage, which would be, you know, a little bit older childhood, but not exactly at puberty yet. So seven to 11. And then the former formal operational stage, which he thought usually kicked in any time past 11. Now, let's keep in mind that these ages are not set in stone. It's not set in stone that if a kid is two, they're then going to move into the pre-operational stage. Or if they're like 11, they're now going to be in the formal operational stage. Remember I said 
students develop at different rates, right? So these are guesses, okay? These are guidelines. They're not perfect deadlines for when these developments should happen, right? Um, yeah, so he thought of this as a, as, a, as a real serious difference from one stage to a number, another not gradual increases, right? So real serious demarcations between one and the next. Okay, so a little description of what happens in the sensory motor stage. Everything is about your sense experiences and movement at that point. That's all you got, right? Physical actions and experiences of senses, touch, taste, sight, those things are your development vehicles at the sensory motor stage, right? You're doing things on reflex. You're doing things because of instinct, not because anybody showed you how to do it a lot of times. Like babies, okay, when they're hungry, nobody tells them, hey, you know, take this bottle and stick the thing in your mouth and suck and that's how you get food no one tells them that it's instinctual they know that they just figure it out right magically it seems um, and that's kind of the way learning is for babies right at that time they figure out instinctually that if they make noise crying the parents will come to them and give them whatever it is they need once they figure out what it is that is the kind of learning babies are doing from you know birth to around two and then we hit the pre-operational stage and you're starting to think of the world in terms of words and images this is really when kids you know they've already learned some words and they're probably talking but this is the part where they really start to think of the world in terms of words and images not just feelings and movements right um, they start thinking symbolically they start connecting more than just the sensory information, the physical actions, uh, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I really think language becomes super important to them in the pre-operational stage. And once you hit the concrete operational stage, you've got a sense of logic. Kids are really starting to get logical. They're thinking concretely. Um, and they're able to, you know, organize and classify objects, right? They know that blue is a color and purple is a color. There's a category. Um, you know, they can look at what happens and they can reason out why it happened. Um, you know, I hit my little brother, <clears throat> so mom put me in time out. I should probably not hit my brother anymore if I don't want to be in timeout, right? Logical thinking kind of on that level. Some kids get there before seven, right? Like I said, these are a little bit, the boundaries aren't really that strong between the two, uh, between them in terms of when you hit these different stages, right? And then finally, the formal operational stage, you know, middle school and high school ages, usually uh, adolescence, they're starting to think about abstract things. Okay, so, you know, concepts like justice and fairness and um, hope and love and peace. Things that are a little harder to define than just, you know, blue is a color, <laughs> right? Um, they're thinking more logically. They're able to more look into if this thing happens, then this will be the reaction or this will be the consequence of that thing. But anyone who's worked with teenagers will tell you that while they can do that thinking, they don't always, <laughs> all right? Sometimes teenagers can be a bit impulsive. Um, so they can think about what's going to happen if they do something, but it doesn't mean they always will, um, all right? And then as you become more of an adult, generally you tend to do that thinking more often, right? So we're all in the formal, formal operational stage, hopefully at this point. Uh, in our college and adulthood journeys. That's where we should be, right? A little more description of the sensory motor stage. While the growth is rapid, you will hear mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunts and uncles saying, oh my goodness, you know, the baby has grown so much. The baby has changed so much. They go from literally not being able to even hold up their heads, right? To being 
able to crawl and play games with you. And maybe they're learning some words. It's so much learning. Mostly it's trial and error. They do a thing. It doesn't work. They try it again. You may see them try it a thousand times before they finally get it right. You know those toys where they have shapes in hole, like holes that are shapes? And then you have the little blocks that are shapes. And you have to try to put the block into the hole that is the same shape as your block. Ever watch a baby do that? They'll just keep trying over and over. Sometimes the same spot, even though it doesn't fit. Or they'll turn it around in their hand and hope that it fits that way. Then eventually maybe they'll try the next hole. Until eventually they find it, right? That's the sort of trial and error learning we're talking about. Right? Um, they begin to learn that what they do makes things happen, right? They give the example of if I shake this rattle, it's going to make a noise. If I squeeze this teddy bear that you gave me, it'll talk to me, <laughs> right? So before they didn't realize that what they did had an effect on the world. Um, you know, at first when they're baby babies, they don't know this. But as time goes on in this stage, they figure that out. In the sensory motor, motor stage, kids are unbelievably egocentric. They kind of don't know anybody else exists other than as a thing to interact with, right? Slowly, slowly, as they come up through this, they begin to realize that, you know, there's something to the world other than what's going on in their own little brains and their own little feelings, right? Um, their point of view is the only one they know. They have no idea what other people are thinking about at this point. Um, and then object permanence at some point in this uh, stage will come to be a thing. You know, babies love to play peekaboo. And at first they really think you're gone. Like you put your hands over your face or you duck behind a piece of furniture. They really think you're gone, that you basically don't exist anymore when they're tiny, tiny, tiny. But as time goes on, they start to realize that, oh no, you're just... You're behind the hands or you're behind the furniture and then they know to look for you, right? You can't play hide and seek, even if they could move. You can't play hide and seek with a, with a really little baby because the second you hide, they'll forget about you. Some people are still like that in adulthood, but, you know, we don't have to talk about that. All right, so the pre-operational stage. They maybe have figured out symbols a little bit at this time, but they also make a lot of errors in their thinking. Um, they're not always right in the way that they think. They try to connect things that don't really connect. Um, they are still pretty egocentric. Uh, they're really not able to understand other people's perspectives or think about other people's perspectives for the most part then. Um, so in this stage, parents end up doing a lot of explaining like, Okay, um, let's say a kid hits their little sister and little sister starts crying. You know, maybe maybe at between two and seven, maybe the kid doesn't really understand necessarily right away why the sister's crying and because they can't see it from her perspective. So you'll hear a parent say something like, okay, how do you feel when your sister hits you? And the kid might say, oh, I don't like it. I get very mad, you know, it, it hurts. Okay. That's a revelation to a kid in the pre-operational stage. Like, they're finally starting to make that connection that, oh, if I do a thing to someone else, they will feel maybe the same way I felt if they did it to me. They may feel some completely different way, right? They're just now very much being introduced to the idea that other people have the same feelings and the same reactions they do, or even different ones. All right? Um... Centration is a thing. They may focus on one characteristic to the exclusion of all others, right? Like, I like unicorns and only unicorns. Do you hand me anything that's not a unicorn? I don't like it. They may look at something and go, blue, I like this thing because it's blue. And then, for example, a cup. But if you try to give them the green cup, oh, no, 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 mm -mm, no, I don't want that green cup. I want that blue one, right? They're really focused on just the one thing. It doesn't matter. Maybe the green cup is a better cup. Maybe it holds more juice, right? doesn't matter. It's not blue. They don't want it, right? 
They will also confuse appearance and reality. This is the stage at which kids will watch cartoons and think they're real. The stage at which they'll watch a movie and, oh God, absolutely forbid, a dog dies in the movie and they literally think the dog is dead, right? Um, so be careful with that <laughs> when dealing with children because you may have to explain to them that, you know, things are not exactly what they think. They've finally gotten to where they can use language in a way that will represent objects, right? So they know that the sippy cup is a sippy cup and to call it a sippy cup, right? Stuff like that. Yeah, that definitely went a little too far, a little too fast. Oh, what happened? Sorry, I have gone farther than I meant to go. Right, here we go. So, you know, um, an example of how like a pre-operational kid's mind will work. Um, Right? So let's say you gave them these dots here. And look, they're, they're the same, you know? There's four of them. And they're spaced evenly and they look exactly the same. Show that to the child, right? And, but, and, and they can tell you, right? This line is exactly like this line. However, if you mess it up a little bit, if you space them differently and then you show it to the kid, they think the row that is longer has more dots. Even though you can count one, two, three, four. This one is one, two, three, four. On first glance, they look and they go, no, the one that's longer is bigger. Okay. We know it's not, but in the pre-operational stage, kids will struggle with that kind of thing, right? Same, same thing if it were this or if it were sticks, right? They will think if they don't look exactly the same, then they must be different somehow, which is kind of interesting. It's a wild phenomenon. Okay, you get into the concrete operational stage and kids are really starting to be logical at this point, right? Seven to 11-ish, give or take. So they're now thinking on mental operations. They're now thinking about rules and strategies. They're also thinking about ways you can use those same rules and strategies in reverse, right? They're thinking about real things, concrete things. They are not yet thinking about abstract things, right? They are a little less egocentric. They're finally starting to really understand what's going on with other people and the fact that other people have feelings and thoughts like they do. And then they, this is where they get to where they understand conservation tasks. So like, like that one thing before... Um, I keep going forwards instead of backwards. So, like, a kid who's in that stage will look at the two rows of dots, count them, and realize they're exactly the same, even though they look different. Right? So where a kid in the pre-operational stage can't do that, a kid that's moved into the concrete operational stage definitely can. Um, Royd? So, and then formal operational, everything 11 and up, you can now think abstractly. This is when kids start to really ask questions about hypothetical things. They start thinking about the future and what might happen. They start coming up with ideological problems. This might be where they start thinking about, like, death. What does that mean? You know, they're going to go to their parents and be like, mm, what happens when you die? Where do you go when you die? Some kids will get to that way before age 11, but, you know, really abstract things that they're thinking about now. Um, kids in that stage, their favorite thing to say is, that's not fair. Because they have just started thinking abstractly about the concepts of fairness and justice. If you teach in a middle school or in a high school, you will hear all the time, that's not fair, that's not fair, that's not... Yeah, it's going to happen because that's what they've moved to in terms of their abstract thinking. They can combine things, they can classify things, they can do that in a way that is much more high level. They can really start that higher order reasoning, all that critical thinking and stuff we were talking about before. They can 
manipulate ideas in their head now. They can play around with concepts and ideas. If you ask them a what if question um, at this point in the game, they're much more able to really toy with the ideas of what if something happened. Um, and they're able to reason inferentially. You don't have to spell everything out for them um, the way you would in previous stages. Okay, so here's a YouTube video you can watch if you want that will give you examples of the different stages. That is in the uh, slideshow, which I have linked for you on Brightspace. We're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna talk a little bit about sociocultural theory. Um, yeah, so student interaction with each other and with teachers and with culture impacts their cognitive development. That is socioculture theory in a nutshell. We've talked a little bit before in a different lecture about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And that is just the range of tasks that a child can perform with help and guidance, but they can't do it independently yet. Like, if you help them, they can do this thing. But they can't do it if you leave them on their own. Right? So, zone of proximal development. You know, uh, let's take cooking, for example. Uh, if a child has decided they want to make cookies, right? Well, maybe they're at a developmental stage where they can read the recipe and follow the instructions. Um... Maybe not. Maybe they can follow instructions, but not read the recipe. So reading the recipe is not within their zone of proximal development, but following instructions is, right? So then it would be the parent's job to get down on the level of their zone of proximal development and, you know, help the child with the part of reading the recipe. Either read it to them, um, help them read it, go through and maybe tell them what the hard words mean, uh, that sort of thing. So that would be meeting a kid in their zone of proximal development. Right? So, you know, just a chart representing what I was telling you about. Here's the current level the student's at independently. Here's what they can do with a more capable person helping them. That's the zone of proximal development. Scaffolding has come up in a ton of places so far. I'm really not going to spend a ton of time on that, but you do need to know that Vygotsky kind of took that concept and ran with it. Uh, so when we talk about scaffolding, we're often referring to Vygotsky's theory. Right? I'm not going to go through these, but here are some very good examples of different kinds of scaffolding, whether that's verbal um, to help people develop more language or whether it's procedural to help them like do different activities um, and some tools you can use for scaffolding. I will not spend time talking about these, but this chart actually probably will come in handy when you start creating your lesson plan. Right, so things to remember about the ZPD or the zone of proximal development. It's different for every student and different for every teacher. Just because your kids are all seven years old doesn't mean they all have the same zone of proximal development. They're gonna be in different places at different times in their development. In order to figure out where they're at, you have to get to know each student. I'm gonna be preaching relationships, relationships, relationships <laughs> throughout probably this entire class, but getting to know your students and where they're at is super important, right? So first, you know, you gotta model the thing. You do it and you let them watch. And then you gotta coach them how to do it. So, you know, they're doing, you know, you, know I, you might be doing it, but then they're sort of helping you do it, right? Which can move into the next step, which is they do it, but you help them do it, right? And then fade. That's when you, as a teacher, just fade into the background, right? The kid is doing it, but you're not intervening. You're not helping them with it. You're just watching them do it. So this is the progress we expect to happen as teachers. We love when we get to this thing where you're just doing things and doing them great without us. That's our ultimate goal. When you finally stop needing our help, it's a beautiful moment. We're so into that, right? Okay, so. Uh, in 
learned some more things about information processing theory. Um, you know, processing theorists think that children's working memory capacity enables them to handle increasingly complex cognitive tasks. As you grow, your working memory grows with you and gets better, theoretically. Um, that's the idea anyway. And then it makes it easier for you to do harder things. Also, your growth in knowledge enhances your ability to learn new things. More background knowledge means better learning in the future. You know, as you become more integrated into, you know, your knowledge, your beliefs, and your thinking processes, that makes learning a lot easier too. Like, those things all work together better as a student ages and develops. Uh, you can think more logically and more abstractly as you develop, and we all know that true expertise in anything only comes from a whole lot of years of study and practice, right? Think about musical instruments. To get really, really good at a musical instrument, that is years of study and practice. It's the same with other kinds of learning, too. Cool. So... You know, Piaget and Vygotsky, mm, these guys kind of overlap a little bit, all right? So you can take a look here at how these things overlap. The one or two things that are really important to remember about what those guys had in common is that their theories hinge on social interactions being very important and that students have to be actively engaged in order to develop, which I think is pretty well accepted in the education world as truth at this point. Okay, so that is pretty much it for this lecture. I know it says by next class, do this, do this. Obviously you have reading guides to work on. You can go ahead and start on the learning theorist posters. I probably would, even though they're now due on the 31st. But yeah, that's basically it for this week. I hope that wasn't too much. I know it's an awful lot, um, but I know you've got this. So let me know. Email me if you have any questions about anything. Uh, if you want to do a Zoom about anything, please let me know. I'm happy to have that happen for you. All right. Peace.